Next to the anti-comics crusade of the 1950s, the speculator era of comics is, quite possibly, one of the worst periods of comic book history. Ironically, it was also one of the best periods in terms of sales and prestige. This was a brief period, only lasting roughly seven years. During its duration, it damaged both the credibility and the viability of the comic book industry. Again, ironically, it also allowed comic books to become an accepted part of popular culture and a legitimate medium. One of the defining features of this era is that quantity trumped quality. And in the end, the cheap cash grab by the publishers and the collectors nearly ruined the industry. Now, what follows is my personal observations of the comic book marketplace between 1989 and 1996. While I've tried to fact check my memory as much as possible, this is mostly anecdotal and observational. So, take it for what it is. The opinionated perspective of a cynical, middle-aged comic geek whose objectivity is more than a little questionable. Got it? Good. Let's move on. There are a few notable events that preceded the speculator boom. The first is the adoption of the direct market by Marvel and DC in the early 80s. This method of distribution not only increased the Big Two's market potential, but it made it possible for them to stop relying on newsstands for sales. This evolving market also allowed new publishers an opportunity to establish themselves and thrive. Briefly, the biggest advantage of the direct market was all the sales were final sales. Newsstands would return unsold copies for a credit, but this wasn't an option for the direct market. They kept what they ordered. In return, they paid a lower cost than newsstands. It was a superior model because publishers knew in advance the demand for a title and they could adjust their print run as necessary. With this new distribution model, multiple comic book specialty stores also began to appear. There aren't accurate numbers, but before the direct market, there were only hundreds of these stores. This number dramatically rose to thousands after the direct market was established. This new distribution system and the expanding retail market led to the black and white boom in the mid-80s. The unbelievable success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles inspired an interest in independent black and white titles. Not only were publishers trying to predict which project would be the next Turtles, but collectors were also doing the same. So sales were better than average for titles that would have otherwise been ignored. Regardless, this was a short-lived trend, and many independent and alternative titles disappeared almost as quickly as they arrived. The overall effect was this. For the first time in roughly a decade, Marvel and DC were seeing very healthy sales. New publishers were also appearing regularly and doing well, even though their sales were a fraction of the big twos. It was a pretty good time for the industry. This is the stage for the forthcoming drama. Let's part the curtains and see what we can see. Comic book history is broken up into some agreed upon ages. There's the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Modern Age. Where each age begins and ends is open to some debate. This holds true for the speculator era, which is a subset of the modern age. In my opinion, this era properly begins in 1989 with the release of the first Tim Burton Batman movie. For those that don't recall, or weren't born then, that movie was a massive success. Not only did it make a bajillion bat bucks, but it legitimized both the character and, by extension, comic books themselves. That movie gave the medium some prestige, and it showed the general public that comic books were no longer a strictly juvenile medium. Of course, it has to be acknowledged that the release of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie the following year helped to continue the momentum that Batman started. But the Batman movie in particular showed everyone that comic books had matured. For the first time, comic books became kind of cool. This general acceptance had a nostalgia factor, as most pop culture things do. This nostalgia factor gave permission to those that read comics as kids to enter a comic book store and to view the items they enjoyed when they were younger. More often than not, this would lead one to purchase a piece of their nostalgia at the most reasonable price they could afford. Invariably, this would also lead to further purchases. Thus, interest in comics began to rise for the first time since the Marvel explosion in the 1960s. This rediscovery of comic books by the general public led to a higher demand for back issues. Consequently, prices for older comic books started to rise as these issues became harder to find. 
Furthermore, current issues of comics began to disappear within days of their release, as opposed to slowly trickling out over a month or so. These two things are rather significant to the ensuing speculator frenzy. For one, publishers saw sales rising, and this increased income allowed them to publish more titles. Secondly, it wasn't unusual for a $1 comic book to command $5 or $10 or even $20 a few months after its release. Cutting to the point, even those with a passing interest in comic books could see that one comic could be profitable to a collector if it became popular and everyone wanted it. Multiple copies of that comic could be a cash cow. So the stage is now set, the players are in place, and it's time for the drama to begin in earnest. With interest in comic books rising, publishers like Marvel and DC began to expand their selection of titles by launching new series. First issues sold really, really well. They always had. One didn't need a market analyst to tell you that. But this increased attention on comic books made them sell even better than before. Now I have to pause for a moment and examine this phenomenon, because it represents a relevant shift in attitude on the part of fans and collectors. A first issue represented a new character, a new concept, and obviously the beginning of a story. So that was the appeal and the reason why first issues classically sold well. Everyone was interested in what could be a new, cool thing. During the speculator era, not only were old concepts rehashed or repackaged for a new generation, but the motivation to purchase a first issue also changed. It was better to buy the comic, even if the concept didn't appeal to you, because despite your opinion of the material, it could be worth something in a few months. So, for a minuscule investment, literally a dollar, one could purchase something that may have a dramatic return. The risk was minimal. The reward was great. It was a no-brainer decision for collectors. Buy the first issue. More often than not, it's a purchase you won't regret. Perhaps the first instance of greedy, cash-grabbing publishing, the codifying event that would spark the speculator frenzy, started with the publication of Batman, Legends of the Dark Knight No. 1, in 1989. This comic was published with four differently colored covers over top the actual cover underneath. As one might expect, collectors went crazy for a new Batman title. And they didn't just buy the cover they liked best, they bought every cover version available. Now, I don't have actual sales figures to back up the following assertion, just my own anecdotal observation. But this comic sold a metric ton, probably in the area of a million copies. But I can't say for certain how accurate that number is, since I can't find any sales data. All I can say for certain is it vastly outsold anything else that year. This comic book set the trend for all newly launched titles thereafter, and for most anniversary issues of ongoing, regular series. There are more factors that contributed to the ensuing speculator frenzy. It wasn't as simple as the major publishers flooding the marketplace with new series, multiple covers, and crossovers, and events. Although, the constant stream of must-have collectibles certainly kept the frenzy going. Basically, there was a lot of greed, not just by publishers, but by comic book collectors and by comic book stores. Comic books started to become short-term investments rather than parts of a collection, which is a significant distinction. Until that point, most collectors only bought what they truly liked and what they intended to hold on to forever and ever. But as previously mentioned, it wasn't unusual for a collector to buy something they literally had no interest in just so they could sell it for a tidy profit a few months later. This increase in the publisher's output also saw a decrease in the quality of the artwork and the stories. I don't want to pick on any specific creators here. All I will say is a lot of people phoned it in during this period, and it shows. It has to be acknowledged that once the speculator frenzy was going full tilt, it really didn't matter what was between the covers. A comic could have had a pretty cover wrapped around 24 pages of sandpaper and no one would have noticed, or cared, as long as it jumped in price a month after its initial release. Then there was Wizard Magazine. Its content was mostly juvenile, and it pandered directly to the speculator market. I'm inclined to say it fed into and influenced the speculator frenzy with their articles about trends in the market, who's the hottest artist, and which comic book female had the biggest rack. They basically preached to the lowest common denominator, and they perpetuated the myth that most comic book fans were horny boys with no social skills and a limited capacity to interact with the opposite sex. 
For a medium that was barely accepted as a medium, this popular magazine was one or two steps of backward progress. It undermined the legitimacy comic books had attained through the 80s. Yes, this is one of those biased opinions I warned everyone about at the beginning. Wizard would be a remarkably forgettable magazine if it wasn't for the influence of the price guide they included with every issue. The price guide was possibly the most specious piece of data collation ever produced. It's possible the price guide wasn't based on any data whatsoever. It appeared as if editorial decided what was going to be hot from month to month, and they adjusted the prices in their guide accordingly. Notably, the price guide reflected the predictions made in the magazine. The odds of that spontaneously happening must be staggering. Overall, prices always skewed unreasonably high in that magazine, rather than towards a median, as one might expect from proper data analysis. Whether intentional or not, Wizard Magazine appeared to create a false demand for worthless comics. Objectively, they were likely riding the hype train, while simultaneously creating hype, in order to capitalize on the popularity of comics. The ethics of this approach are questionable, as was their relationship with certain publishers. Ironically, in a unique but brief moment of insight, publishers accurately predicted that collectors would eventually tire of this multiple cover sales tactic. So they expanded into gimmick covers, ones that glowed in the dark or were die cut or had holograms. The permutations were seemingly infinite. The bottom line was to get a collector to buy multiple copies of a comic book based on its cover, rather than the content of the issue itself. And collectors and comic stores willingly complied. This tactic worked very well, until it didn't. Many place the end of the speculator era around the publication of the death of Superman. In my opinion, that comic signaled the beginning of the end, but it wasn't the end itself. I mark the actual end of the speculator era as 1996, when Marvel Comics, the largest publisher, filed for bankruptcy. This was an astounding turn of events, but not altogether surprising to anyone that was paying attention. During the early 90s, when Marvel became a publicly traded company, there were some excessively bad decisions that were implemented to increase the stock price. Purchasing the distributor, Heroes World, is an example. Buying and then eviscerating Malibu's Ultraverse may be another example. These decisions were mostly responsible for Marvel Comics almost collapsing. They were aggressively expanding while their source of income was disappearing. So the unpredicted, steady decline of sales was definitely a contributing factor to Marvel's fate. Comic book sales began to nosedive around 1994. This decline began for a few reasons. For one, the comic books were mostly garbage. It's difficult to think of one example of a classic comic book story from that time. In fact, this era is more remembered for its lousy, convoluted stories more than anything. But as the saying goes, your mileage may vary. Generally speaking, those that enjoyed the superhero genre found the quality of the artwork and stories to be less than satisfying. The most important factor was, people stopped buying comics as an investment. Speculating on the future worth of a comic book became a losing proposition for everyone involved. And this realization, this disillusionment, permeated the comic book market following the publication of the aforementioned Death of Superman. The reason comics became a terrible investment might be obvious, but I'll explain it anyway. For the most part, a person who speculated would pre-order multiple copies of a comic from a comic book store. Then they would sell those comics at a grossly inflated price a short time later. In a nutshell, that was the standard game back in the day. However, comic book stores played the same game as the speculators, only on a larger scale. If advance orders for Amazing X Thing No. 1 came in at, say, 1,000 copies, comic book stores would generally order 2 or 3,000 copies in total, and also bet on this comic becoming a hit. I'm sure everyone can see where this is headed. If everyone who wanted a copy has already pre-ordered multiple copies, who was going to buy all those additional unsold copies? The answer to the question is no one. No one is going to buy a copy of Amazing X Thing because everyone already has a pile of Amazing X Thing. So both speculators and stores ended up with stacks of worthless paper. Over time, those stacks grew and grew, and it became obvious that speculating was no longer a worthwhile venture. 
This null state, where it was all supply and no demand, didn't last for very long, perhaps six months to a year. But once this point was reached, entropy took over, and the decline kicked in hard. It didn't happen all at once, but over a short period of time, the market bled out. Disillusioned speculators and casual collectors abruptly stopped buying anything. Comic book stores found themselves sitting on months worth of stock they couldn't even sell at a loss. In turn, with sales at stores flatlining, store owners cut their monthly orders from publishers. As a consequence, sales began to plummet for comic book publishers. At first, it must have looked like an anomaly, a few bad months of sales. Then a few more months passed, and sales kept dipping lower and lower. The downward spiral became obvious. The publishers responded to this dip in sales by pumping out even more useless gimmicky crap to stimulate the market. For the record, gimmick covers were expensive to produce. Publishers also had a habit of printing a significant amount more than what they received in advance orders. This way they could meet future demand. But there was no demand whatsoever. The future was empty. And a lot of publishers wasted a lot of money printing comics that no one would ever want. By the end of 1996, when Marvel Comics filed for bankruptcy, it became obvious to everyone that the speculator era was over. Not coincidentally, a lot of comic book stores also started going out of business around this time. It was a pretty bleak period for comic books. In fact, I don't think the industry ever fully recovered from this period. Sure, it has stabilized, and it's on relatively solid ground now, but its monthly sales are roughly on par with what they were before the direct market was established. That's a level of irony that's difficult to overlook. The devastation of the comic book industry happened because of untempered excess. The death of Superman projected the image that publishers were willing to do anything, even kill a character that inspired an entire genre if it boosted their quarterly earnings. In turn, collectors, casual readers, and speculators were willing to support this trend as long as they also benefited. When those benefits diminished and then disappeared, so did the speculators and casual readers. That left the collectors, many of whom felt subconsciously cheated or disillusioned by the rampant greed they had witnessed. From a fan's perspective, for a brief time thereafter, comic books felt like a pet rock, or a beanie baby, or a Pokemon card. The medium had been ravaged by pop culture acceptance, and then abandoned as quickly as it was accepted. So those of us left behind following the apocalypse had to accept that their special interest was subject to fads and trends like any other disposable product. The sales tactics used during the speculator era are still in use today, but they've evolved. Instead of multiple covers, you get retailer incentive variants. That's literally a variation on the theme. It involves a store ordering more copies than necessary to get a rare cover they can sell at an inflated price to compensate for the surplus in their initial order. Instead of launching new titles, existing titles are continually rebooted to generate sales spikes. As an example, The Avengers, a core title at Marvel, has been rebooted with a new number one eight to ten times since 2004. This is not an exaggerated number. Crossovers between complementary titles, such as anything that begins with Spider, Bat, or X, are quite common, as are events that span all of the titles of a company's line. These tactics are a short-term strategy that's effective for a very brief period, but it has the cumulative, long-term effect of making a collector feel dissatisfied, or worse yet, like they're being cheated. This is one symptom of the recently named syndrome, Event Fatigue. The upside to the industry crashing and burning is that good content became the focus for both publishers and collectors in the ensuing years. Objectively, the quality of the writing and artwork has probably never been better. While some may disagree with this point, the focus on good content has also led to an interesting diversity of opinions, perspectives, and approaches to the medium. Superheroes are still a big deal, but many other genres are also represented. So while the fallout of the 90s was pretty terrible, the end result was a better product overall. It bears repeating at the end that the proceeding represents my view of that specific era. This is not a historical document. It is, at best, anecdotal and observational. It shouldn't be taken as the gospel truth, 
It's merely as accurate as memory allows. And it's definitely filtered through my biased perspective. Certainly, there may be others with a different take on that era. Some may disagree with part or all of this assessment. And that's fair. Such is the nature of experience. It's uneven from individual to individual. Neither is necessarily wrong, just different. As for my credentials, so to speak, I was a fixture in the community during this entire period, so I was a functional adult that experienced all of this firsthand. The bulk of my free time was spent in comic book stores having all the conversations. I was the self-effacing guy who realized his obsession with comic books was borderline absurd, possibly pathological. But I didn't care. It was my thing, and I owned it. I still do. This and my bemused objectivity are my most charming qualities. Then, as now, I was someone who didn't care whether your obsession was Neat Stuff or Wonder Woman or Black Kiss or Spider-Man. You were in my tribe. You were my kind. And despite the more negative aspects of the speculator era, this discovery is an irreplaceable experience. And it may be why I remember it with a certain level of clarity. I wanted to remember it all, because it all felt significant. So, in the end, this video may be a critique, and it may be unflattering at points, but that simply reflects life itself. It can be messy and disorganized. Chaos is manifest, and order seems like a luxury. But those are the factors that keep things interesting.